Welcome to True Health Tuesdays, and the truth will set you free. <laughs> Cholesterol, okay? I, does your body do anything stupid? Okay, if you're saying yes, okay, I'm, I'm glad you're here because we've got to educate you. Okay, now first, let's go, we're going to go over the theory, okay, that this evil stuff that your intelligent designed body is producing is clogging the arteries. Now, here's the theory um, that most heart attacks are caused by blocked arteries, plaque buildup. Plaques composed of cholesterol that build up inside of the artery. Eventually cut off the blood supply, cut off the oxygen, muscle dies, and it's really bad. Okay, according to the Mayo Clinic, you have good and bad cholesterol. You're going to know that there is no such thing as good or bad cholesterol. Anybody that believes that is ignorant. Okay, LDL is considered bad cholesterol because this um, cholesterol builds up in the walls of the arteries, making them narrow. Now, this is according to the Mayo Clinic. High-density lipoprotein is good cholesterol, according to the Mayo Clinic. Okay, this is definitely not according to me because it takes the excess cholesterol back to the liver. Um, according to the Mayo Clinic, when you have high cholesterol, you may develop fatty deposits in your blood vessels. Eventually, these deposits make it difficult for blood to flow. Your heart may not get as much oxygen-rich blood, increases heart attack, and decreases blood flow to the brain. This is all really scary stuff, and these are very, very well-known people. Now, according to the National Inst or Mayo Clinic, cholesterol is a waxy substance found in your blood. Well, ooh, interesting. Well, your body needs cholesterol to continue building healthy cells. Well, your, your body needs cholesterol to continue building healthy cells. However, we got this dichotomy here where we got this nasty stuff that's clogging the arteries that your bo stupid body is just making and it just happens to fill up the arteries with fat, but then it's absolutely vital to build healthy cells. So what's the theory? Well, why does it clog veins? Anyone want to know? Yeah. Okay. It doesn't because it's different. Well, for one, if you look at this, and this is a good diagram, and this is kind of a diagram of progressive um, bad, you'll see that there's a line of cells in between the so-called plaque or the placking of the artery. That's because it doesn't form inside of the lumen where the blood flow is. It forms underneath what's called the endothelial layer. Now, arteries are different. They actually have three layers. They have an outer layer, a middle muscular layer, okay, and then you have this inside or the endothelial layer. Now, the muscular layer literally constricts or dilates depending on its need. When we talked about the autonomic nervous system, we talked about stress, shutting blood supply down to the gut, opening up, dilating blood vessels to the arms and legs. So this is the whole purpose of those arteries is they constrict and dilate. Now, if that theory that, that fatty substances block the arteries, d why is it blocking the ones with the muscle layer? Why, why isn't it blocking the capillaries where it gets really, really small? Don't ask that, okay? Because it's going to really blow the theory that fatty deposits are clogging the arteries, okay? Do you understand? So I don't want you being critical thinking right now. So this right here is what's supposed to be happening. And so these fatty substances somehow are getting underneath that endothelial layer causing damage to the artery. Now, the artery, these muscles, actually have little blood vessels called vasovasorums, okay, where they're actually, um, they, they have to get blood because they are a muscular layer. So let's look at more of the damage that's being done here because you're gonna see that the plaques may get bigger, may get larger. So what's actually happening here? Now, again, according to the Mayo Clinic, the term heart disease is interchangeable with cardiovascular disease. And the theory is the clogged artery theory. And this is why we have angiograms, we have stents, we have balloon angioplasties, we have bypass surgeries. The entire theory is that the clogged arteries are, are causing the damage, leading to heart attack, chest pain, angina, and stroke, according to the National Institute of Health. 
Atherosclerosis is a disease where plaque builds up inside of the arteries. Why? Plaque is made of a fat, cholesterol, calcium, and other substances found in the blood. Atherosclerosis, or hardening of the arteries, can lead to serious problems, stroke, heart attack, even death. Now, it's interesting, when you look at the Journal of Circulation, recent observations have demonstrated that acute coronary syndrome, or sudden cardiac death, cannot be predicted or necessarily associated with significant obstruction of that arterial or coronary arteries. Interesting. So here we have all of these ideas that it's this evil cholesterol that's clogging the arteries, even though it doesn't clog the arteries, it goes underneath the endothelium. Um, but, but now it says it's not. So what is the process of this? And this is really a cool article, Role of Oxidative Modifications in Atherosclerosis. This is really cool because they talk about inflammation. Okay, that's actually inflammation needs to be considered as the primary pot process of the hardening of the arteries, which that makes sense. Now it's oxidative stress has a secondary event. To address this issue, they proposed oxidative response to inflammation as a model of reconciling the response to in injury and oxidative modification hypothesis of atherosclerosis. See, what this is, now this makes sense. Why doesn't it clog the capillaries? Well, if you've got these fatty deposits just kind of floating around and they stick to the arterial wall and then they build up, why are they forming underneath the endothelial layer? So, so if you're a questioning physician and you think that this is really a problem, why aren't they doing the capillaries? This makes sense. Because we got an arterial layer and this is where the plaque forms. So something is damaging the artery. And so this, in a repair process, is a protective mechanism. And it turns out that the LDL, or low density lipoproteins, which is not bad, that's actually the protein carrier that carries this valuable substance called cholesterol to the site of an injury. So more LDL means there's more injury or there's a need for hormone production. It's interesting that polyunsaturated fatty oils, now is that common in our food supply? Yeah, it was it common in our ancestry food supply? No, it's, it's totally, totally new unless you talk about olive oil and that's, that's not, it doesn't have a lot of free radicals in it. <clears throat> now the polyunsaturated fats are a source of free radicals that can actually damage the arterial wall. Now vegetable oils constrict blood vessels, increase platelet stickiness which raises blood pressure and cause damage to the arterial wall. So this makes sense. So if you're exposed to a toxic substance and it's actually damaging the muscular layer, the muscular layer, not the endothelial lining, because remember, where does the plaque occur? Underneath the endothelial layer. So that makes sense that there's something toxic that's damaging it. Now, um, the white blood cells penetrate their arterial walls. Okay, so macrophages go in, and these are called big eaters. So you have this damage um, from the free radicals. The LDL goes in there, tries to protect it, and the macrophages try and clean up the excess. Now, HDL particles are going to go in there, the high-density lipoprotein, and remove any of the um, excess LDLs. However, if foam cells and HDL aren't able to process the oxidization, atheroma, or that means tumor, forms. And this is why that doctors erroneously are saying, well, this is good and this is bad. That doesn't make any sense, because what's the purpose of it? And Ron Rosendell, brilliant MD, okay? If excessive damage is occurring throughout um, that is necessary to distribute extra cholesterol throughout the bloodstream, it would not seem very wise to merely lower cholesterol and forget about why it's there in the first place. That makes sense. So you have high cholesterol. Does the doctor go in and say, man, you've got an inflammatory process going on here. You have tissue damage or you have a need for hormone production. We need to check out the physical, chemical, or emotional stressors. Do you eat a lot of fast food? Do you go to restaurants? Where's your, where's your problem? Why would, why would your intelligent body produce excess lo low density lipoprotein unless there's tissue damage. Does that make sense so far? I know, there's still a couple of people here saying, no, I was taught that LDL is bad and HDL is good. I'm gonna hold on to this knowledge. <laughs> till I get halfway through the lecture, then my mind will explode. 
Okay, so it's the reason for chronic inflammation. So we got to look at what's causing inflammation. Think, think of this. You know, instead of a scar, let's say you have multiple traumas, multiple damage to those arteries. Now, the arteries are so important that if you cut an artery in the leg, you're dead in about 10 minutes. You cut an artery in the, in the abdomen, you're dead in about 15 seconds. Okay, they're, they're under tremendous amount of pressure. So the body to protect those arterial walls, it's, it's huge. Um, no cell can form without cholesterol. So cholesterol is a vital substance. It's not just gonna be willy-nilly clogging arteries. That doesn't make any sense. So if you have high levels of cholesterol in your body, you got two things going on. A need for hormones or there's a sign of tissue damage. Now, do we have a lot of inflammatory processes going on in our population? Okay, have you ever heard of inflammatory diseases, like inflammatory brain diseases, you know, such as autism or asthma or bronchitis or itis of anything? Okay, those are inflammatory diseases. Okay, and your body's gonna produce cortisol, which is great anti-inflammatory. What, what does your body make cortisol out of? Cholesterol. Cholesterol, oh, that's so true. So if you're exposed to something that inflames the body, you're right. So we look at the structure of this. High density lipoprotein is not cholesterol. That is a protein carrier to carry this fat molecule, okay, through this liquid blood. Low density lipoprotein is not cholesterol. It's a protein carrier that carries this valuable fat molecule through the blood. And this is the constituents of it. And you'll see HDL and LDL, they have a little bit different constituents, but you know, it's, it's basically the same material. Now they talk about different types of LDL, or they call it very low density lipoprotein or intermediate density lipoprotein. Now the very, the VLDL, uh, now, some doctors are starting to learn that this is the really bad cholesterol, that it's very, very dense and small and can actually damage the arteries. However, VLDL is converting in the bloodstream to LDL, to low-density lipoprotein. So if we have excess VLDL and it's actually converted to something that we can utilize LDL, which is low-density lipoprotein, which five minutes ago you thought was bad cholesterol, you understand it's not bad cholesterol now, right? Okay, yeah. If you still don't get it, you will in a couple of minutes. Okay, so, so the VLDL is actually converted. So when we have excess VLDL or very low density lipoprotein, there's, there's gotta be a problem with the conversion. You know, what's causing this? So you just don't wanna lower it. Well, low density lipoprotein, which is converted from VLDL, it's, um, it has a job. And in fact, it's a critical component of all cell membranes. It serves as a brain antioxidant. So that means any type of thing that's gonna damage the brain, we need excess or higher LDL levels. It's a raw material that can, um, for which your body manufactures vitamin D, cortisol, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. And so if you look at this, progesterone actually protects you from a lot of different cancers. So if you have high LDL, would this now be a clue that maybe there's a risk of cancer? Maybe there's tissue damage, maybe there's inflammation. Or should we just close our eyes blindly, think the body's stupid and start drugging it to lower it? I'm sorry, that's what they're doing today. <laughs> okay. okay, so let's look at the Journal of Neurology. Increasing the LDL, low density lipoprotein cholesterol, tended to be associated with a decreased severity of all MRI markers for cerebral small vessel disease. Increasing, wow. So that means more LDL, more of what you know people erroneously call bad cholesterol. It turns out that if you have more low density lipoprotein, it's protective for the brain. That, that makes sense when we look at this, oh my God, it serves as a brain antioxidant. So that does make sense. And it's interesting, increasing triglycerides, which you get from eating toxic sugars, but not other lipid fractions, were associated with MRI markers of small cerebral vessel disease in older communities. And this is uh, huge because have you heard of dementia? Okay, is that a problem today? Yes. Do you know that it costs four times to treat dementia in this country what it does to treat cancer? So, so this is huge. 
um, researchers concluded that there was a strong correlation between threatening brain changes and the blood measurement of triglycerides. However, high low density lipoprotein was associated with less risk of brain changes. Holy moly, this is not the bad guy that we were led to believe. And so the triglycerides reflect blood sugar, okay, or, or toxic sugars, not the amount of fat a person consumes. So it turns out that LDL has a protective effect. Good God, this can't be. How could the medical community be so wrong? Okay, let's look at the Journal of Stroke. Since carbohydrate intake is associated with atherosclerosis, uh, the large arteries within the brain, eating lower amounts of carbohydrates would be a wise dietary modification. That makes sense, it does. Okay, New England Journal of Medicine. Let's look at strokes. Despite opposing relationships between cholesterol levels to ischemic hemorrhagic strokes, the distribution of risk is not evenly across cholesterol. The Mr. Fit trial was brilliant. Okay, I mean, this thing went through, well, we detail out this in our six hour long high blood pressure cardiovascular disease series. But just look at this, stroke mortality was the lowest between 180 and 200 cholesterol. Okay, that's, that's the lowest. Below that, okay, below 180 and above 240, it was the highest. So it turns out that we have a balance. Now this is stroke. If you have stroke, do you have healthy blood vessels or poor blood vessels? Do you have healthy blood or poor blood? Do you have a disease process going on? Possibly inflammation, possibly something else. So, so instead of just looking at cholesterol levels, now that you know that low-density lipoprotein is actually beneficial and has a function, we have to start looking into it a little bit more. It turns out hypocholesteremic, this means low cholesterol patients, had a higher incidence of intracerebral bleeds, depression, and cancer. So it turns out that if you don't have low-density lipoprotein, you have an increase in depression, increase in cancer, and increase in stroke. Um, lower cholesterol and early death, half of um, cardio, uh, coronary artery disease patients had LDL levels of below 100. Turns out that high cholesterol levels are protective. Now here's a number of references because I know there's going to be a lot of uh, internet trolls saying, no, it can't be, I was taught by the best. Well, you know, you got to learn, okay? And I got to tell you, the, the toughest thing when you're looking at references like this, I was talking with one of the docs because when you get this information, it's like, I'm not the only one that has access to a computer. I can't possibly be the only doctor questioning whether in, in, in the doctor's arrogance that we're smarter than your own physiology. Yeah, we're all taught that the body is self-healing and regulating, okay, self-healing, self-regulating, except when we have different values and we're smarter than your body, so I'm going to give you a drug to lower it. That, that, that doesn't make any sense. So, so I'm looking in there to find out if in our arrogance that we're actually causing more harm. And sure enough, I come across this data. Let's look at the Journal of the American Medical Association. Okay, our findings do not support the hypothesis that hyper, elevations in cholesterol, hypercholesterolemia, or low HDL are important risk factors for all-cause mortality, coronary artery disease, mortality, hospitalizations, heart attacks, unstable angina in persons seven years old or over. So, I mean, that was back in 1994. British Medical Journal. Conclusions, lowering serum cholesterol concentrations does not reduce mortality and is unlikely to prevent coronary artery disease. Claims of the opposite are are based on preferential citation of supportive trials. It sounds like there's an inside job going on there. So, so what happens? Okay, knowing that, that LDL cholesterol is no longer bad, that it's actually beneficial and protects the brain and is vital for hormone production, and that's what, that's what it does, okay? And then if you have an excess of cholesterol after the hormone production and everything else, then the HDL brings it back to the liver to store it and wait for the next inflammatory response or tissue damage, okay? This, so this is the process that goes on. So what if you decide that you're smarter than the body and decide to lower it? Yes, I know. Did anyone hear the cash register? First drug, baby. Man, if I didn't have morals or ethics, can you imagine investing in this one? $10 billion a year. It first, it crossed the $10 billion mark. First drug ever. I mean, just brilliant. 
Well, the effects of this, okay, because you can't say side effects, the actual effects of it, headache, joint pain, constipation, sleep problems, insomnia. Wait a second, isn't the cholesterol the, you know, vital substance around every cell? Unexplained muscle pain, confusion, memory problems. Oh, that's right, it was an antioxidant for the brain. Um, fever, tiredness, pain, burning when you urinate, uh, ur no urination at all, increased thirst, the fruity breath odor, drowsiness, nausea, stomach pain. Well, statins, okay, when they first came out in the studies, they knew that it depleted the body of coenzyme Q10, which is, which is really valuable. So in the first studies, they actually bound coenzyme Q10 to the cholesterol-lowering drug in the trials, except that was really expensive. So when it got approved by the FDA, they decided to produce it without the coenzyme Q10. So it was um, heart failure more than doubled from 1989 to 1997. Heart failure. Now, now that's huge. What if we had any species on the planet, okay, that had a doubling of heart failure in that short amount of time? Would we go in and say, good God, what's going on? Okay, or we would just say, hey, they're defective, they need more drugs. Okay, because I want to get that uncommon sense initiated here. We can't call it common anymore. Now, Interference with the production of coenzyme Q10 by statin jugs is the most likely explanation. Well, I don't know. Let's look at something more recent. How about uh, 2015? Statins stimulate atherosclerosis and heart failure. Doctors that are watching this now, can you ethically or morally prescribe this stuff? Okay. Thus, the epidemic of heart failure and atherosclerosis that plagues the modern world may be paradoxically be aggravated by the pervasive use of statin drugs. We propose that the current statin treatment guidelines be critically reevaluated. How can they possibly do that when we have standards of care that if you don't hold with, you don't get paid? Okay, I mean, it's, it's mind boggling. Let's look at the clinical cardiology. Statin therapy was associated with decreased myocardial function, that's heart muscle function. Statin use is associated with increase in prevalence of coronary plaques producing calcium. So it increases the plaque, increases heart failure, increases damage to the heart muscle. New England Journal of Medicine, this is called a, the hidden study, okay? They had to stop it because an increased risk of mortality or morbidity to an unknown mechanism. We don't know, but there is too many people dying from the study. Okay, what about cancer? Remember, you need cholesterol for a healthy, healthy cells. Okay, we need it for progesterone. Without cholesterol, you can't produce progesterone, estrogen, testosterone. You can't produce cortisol. You can't produce the glucocorticosteroids, minocorticosteroids, sex hormone. Progesterone protects you from cancer. So if you lower that, the CARE breast trial, um, cancer rates, taken a statin increased 1,500%. Heart protection study, sh study showed an increase of non-melanoma skin cancer. <sighs> Harvard Medical School, statins could increase risk of a second stroke in these patients outweighing any other heart benefits from the drug. Any heart benefits? Have you seen heart benefits yet? Okay, British Medical Journal, low cholesterol levels are associated with decreased survival from a stroke. Now, why would that be from ischemic? That means lack of oxygen to the tissue. Why would low cholesterol? Oh, that's right. Cholesterol actually protects the brain. It's an antioxidant. Okay. A Scottish study found that for every 40 point decrease in serum cholesterol, 9% increased risk of mortality for all types of stroke. What does cholesterol do? Okay, what does cholesterol do? Well, it's vital to proper neurologic function, plays a role in formation of memory and uptake hormones. So does that mean that if you're taking cholesterol-lowering drugs that you can have damage to the memory? <sighs> um, serotonin, bodies feel good chemicals. When cholesterol levels drop too low, the serotonin receptors can't work. Cholesterol is vital for the body's repair process. It's the pre precursor to vitamin D. 
Um, uh, bile salts required for digestion of fat are made from cholesterol. You need this. If you can't break down fats, you can't produce hormones. Cholesterol is a powerful antioxidant. That means if you have tissue damage, you need cholesterol for tissue repair. Cholesterol is the main organic molecule in the brain, constituting over half the dry weight of the brain. And, and, and we're lowering this. Cholesterol is a precursor to all hormones. Uh, it's glucocorticosteroids, minocorticosteroids, sex hormones. It's the building block that the body uses to make this stuff out of. Cort uh, corticoids are the cholesterol-based adrenal hormones that the body uses to respond to types of stress. This is like cortisol, promotes healing, produces sex hormones. So what happens if you have low levels of cholesterol? What if, what if there's some defect in your body? Blood sugar problems, swelling, edema, mineral deficiencies, chronic inflammation, you can't produce the cortisol, difficulty in healing, allergies, asthma, reduced libido, infertility, reproductive problems. But the American Heart Association, yes, they broke from the Joint National Committee 8, so they just came out with a new blood pressure. Yes, the old blood pressure, anybody know what blood pressure is supposed to be? 120 over 80, close. That was Joint National Committee 6, that was 1994. Okay, that lasted till 2004. Then it went down to 115 over 75. That lasted to 2014. Then it went up, if you're over 60, to 150 over 90. However, the Clinical College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association decided to break from Joint National Committee 8, and now they're going for 130 over 80. Science, anyone? No, there's no science basis in this. It, it, and by the way, that means half of America qualifies for blood pressure drugs. You gotta see our video on blood pressure. Now they advise to use liquid vegetable oils such as canola, safflower, sunflower. All polyunsaturates provide a source of free radicals which damage the arteries, damage the heart. Vegetable oils constrict the blood vessels, increasing platelet stickiness. They also say that saturated fats are bad, okay? Uh, Medscape, I definitely recommend everyone to do that. I couldn't put it on here, but here's another beautiful article, just um, 2017, last month. Uh, saturated fats does not clog the arteries. Coronary heart disease is a chronic inflammatory condition. The risk can be effectively reduced with lifestyle interventions. Good. God, we can heal ourselves? I know. <laughs> you know, it's a trip, because if you cut yourself, you say, hey, don't bug me. i got to heal this. <laughs> no, your body's self-healing and self-regulating. All doctors, body self-healing and self-regulating. Does that make sense? It turned out, if you look at European Journal of Clinical Nutrition, increased polyunsaturated fat intake uh, doubled stroke mortality. British Journal of Nutrition, polyunsaturated fats are vulnerable to oxidation within the body and their incorporation into lipoproteins would make those lipoproteins more likely to oxidize. So uh, uh, maybe the American Heart Association isn't reading. You're right, these are European journals. Any Europeans in here? Yes, you are. <laughs> You're dressed better and look better than others, yes, I know. I knew it right off the bat. And you're bigger and stronger than others, yes. <laughs> uh, increased omega-6 uh, uh, polyunsaturated fats intake is unlikely to provide the intended benefits and may actually cause an increased risk of coronary heart disease and death. So that means what you put in your mouth is important. Now the problem is, omega-3 to 6 ratio, or 6 to 3 ratio, it should be a 1 to 1 ratio. Disease starts at 8 to 1. American diet is 20 to 1. Some of the oils that the American Heart Association are recommending are 200 to 1. Okay, this is an inflammatory process. If you read packaged foods, it has these oils in there. Why? Because bacteria aren't going to eat that crap. Okay, it's bad for the bacteria. It's going to be bad for you. However, Omega-3s from small animal sources are amazing. If you're vegan, you can get it from plant sources. But this, the Journal of the American Dietetic Association. Since there's evidence that fatty fish is protective against stroke, we should give priority to reducing omega-6 from vegetable oils. Absolutely. Vitamin D3 and K2. 
This is essential, essential. Grass-fed animal products, fermented foods, certain cheeses, this is what you gotta do. In hyperlipidemic patients, serum vitamin D was a significant interdependent inverse determinant of total cholesterol. Okay, yeah, I read this stuff. You know how it's worded? It's worded backwards and sideways, okay? Serum vitamin D may be protective against cardiovascular disease. That's all you need to know, okay? If you have healthy amounts of vitamin D, and if we're in northern hemisphere in the wintertime, you're not getting enough. So you gotta get it from fatty foods, you gotta take vitamin D supplements, you've got to get this stuff. Uh, Journal of the American College of Nutrition. Population-based study of middle-aged men, vitamin D deficiency had a significant positive association with the presence of coronary artery calcification. Is that a weird way to word it? You know, we don't have enough vitamin D and we're seeing an increased risk of damage to the arteries. It makes sense. This is what you need, okay? When we talk about health, d lose the arrogance, okay? Your body is gonna have an elevation or an adaptive physiologic response to inflammatory processes. If we damage the body, it's gonna increase it. You need appropriate nerve supply, why? because those arteries are gonna constrict and dilate based on your need. If you're in a stressed environment, those arteries are gonna constrict blood supply to the gut, and it's gonna vasodilate blood supply to the arms and legs. It's gonna put you in a stressed state. Exercise. It's shown that if you exercise, you're oxygenating the system, the body actually heals. Proper nutrition, this means reduce your polyunsaturated fat intake because hardening of the arteries doesn't occur. It's an adaptive physiologic response to toxicity or deficiency. You put yucky stuff in your body, you're gonna have a yucky body. Okay, was that, was that okay for her? Did she get that? If you put yucky stuff in your body, you're gonna have a yucky body. <laughs> that was only for you, dear. Okay, <laughs> sufficient rest. You need this for regeneration of tissue and prayer and meditation. I mean, this is a snippet. We go into a huge, in this blood pressure course, I don't think it's available yet. It'll probably be available around January. But we detail out all the stuff on what blood pressure is, how it's measured, the interventions, how psychotic it is. And this is just a snippet on cholesterol. Uh, I mean, it, it's gonna be several hours long. Um, already, you can see a lot of the videos that we have online, and look at the data. Because, I mean, it, it's only gonna change from the doctors up. Okay, if the, the, the public goes into the doctor's office and they say, man, you have high bad cholesterol, and you've got this information, and you say, well, gee, doc, doesn't LDL, isn't that precursor to all the hormones my body makes, and isn't that you know, a response to environmental stimulus? Shouldn't I be looking at my stress levels? Okay, you know what just happened to the doctor? His stress levels just went up. <laughs> <laughs> question, question this stuff, because the quality of your life depends on the quality of questions you ask. Okay, now, any questions? because next week we're gonna talk about that hardening of the arteries, if they close, what are the interventions and how effective are they? That means stents, angioplasties, bypass, the data behind it, what it does. Yes, sir. There are a number of studies in the medical world where they show that lowering cholesterol, specifically lowering LDL cholesterol and ApoB, decrease the incidence of coronary artery disease. Mm -hmm. so how does that re relate to what you're saying? When you look at the study that talks about the British Medical Journal, saying those studies are not accurate, small sample size, maybe not too long, or they might not be looking at other, other aspects of it. It's in very big studies, like the heart protection study, that had thousands and thousands of people over a long period of time given statin drugs, and, and they showed a, a very significant decrease in coronary artery disease. Mm -hmm. Here's one for um, 500,000 people of Denmark. Uh, people who took statins were more likely to develop polyneuropathy. Here's one. All had. Largest North American trial ever. 
on cholesterol-lowering drugs showed no difference after three and six years. Uh, 10,000 people, four years. Prevostatin, the Prospertil. Um, Prevostatin compared to placebo, and these are people with no past cardiovascular event. 44% had a secondary event. Total mortality and total serious adverse events were unchanged by Prevostatin as compared to the placebo in the treatment group. However, the treatment group had an increased risk of cancer. So let me see, that's half a million, 10,000. What's your basis? Is the body not smart? Why is cholesterol produced? What's the function of cholesterol? See, when you go look and look at these studies, when you look at them, the body's stupid and we need to give a drug to counteract that? Or is it an environmental response to stimulus? You know, and this, this goes on like the, the basic common sense. It could be both. You know, the body does certain things that ultimately um, work against it. For example, in congestive heart failure, the cardiac output decreases. The, the body, the receptors recognize that the cardiac output is decreased and causes the body to start holding on to salt and water. However, the body doesn't know when to stop. And so in, in severe congestive heart failure, it keeps holding on to the, the fluids. Those fluids spill into the lung and pulmonary edema happens and eventually the patient expires. Mm -hmm. So as physicians, we give diuretics and other medications to pull to get the body to stop pulling onto fluid. So the, mm -hmm. the body initially had a, 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 a compensative response to, to pull on the salt and water to hold on mm -hmm. to increase the cardiac output, but it didn't know when to stop. So in, in, in that sense, the body was not intelligent. It didn't know when to stop holding on. I would, I would have a different, different scenario on that, only because what started, what, what initiated the process, process was there some type of physical, chemical, or emotional stress that wasn't addressed? Could, could there be a decreased protein synthesis where you're not making those, breaking the proteins to amino acids, so you had loss of integrity, where the lungs, um, the alveoli in the lungs weren't able to do that oxygen transfer? You know, and then given a diuretic, um, using diuretics, we're talking about ventricular failure because of ventricular tachycardia, because of loss of minerals. So for, for short term, possibly, but I'm looking at the long term at what the body does. Why is it there? I don't see a lot of times when the body is stupid. When the body has severe toxicity and deficiency, and the, most of the diseases we're treating are an adaptive physiologic response based on that toxicity or deficiency. I mean, I, when I look at the body, I think the body is intelligent. And I think its responses to the environment are intelligent. And then I look and I find out that the underlying source of it isn't that the body started to adapt to some toxic deficient environment and it, it just got stupid, okay? The toxicity and deficiency ended up to be a pathological level. And that's when medications are absolutely needed, when the body is completely toxic. But when you start to give somebody with an elevation in LDL cholesterol, a cholesterol-lowering drug, and not finding out why it's elevated, that, that doesn't make sense. Well, for example, like a, a patient who has uh, homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, where their LDL cholesterol from when they're a <laughs> child is 400, 500. Yes. And they start having a heart attacks at age 15 to 20. I mean, so... Uh, the body, they're eating the same thing that everybody else is eating, but their body, because of genetic mutation, is doing something that is not good for it and eventually leads to their death. Yeah, their I'd, I'd age like to... unless not intervened. Well, no, I'd like to find out what, what the, the genetic aberration is, because we've got one gal, she's 97, um, her daughter was concerned because she's had cholesterol levels of over 500 for her whole life, and she's healthy. 
So that's an adaptive physiologic response to something, or it may be just normal for her. But kids dying at heart attacks, that could be a congenital aberration, and that's totally appropriate to use a drug, completely appropriate. And it's completely inappropriate to give somebody a drug who has LDL, has an adaptive physiologic response to a toxic deficient environment. Yeah, I'm not saying don't use drugs, I'm saying don't use drugs stupidly. You know, yes ma'am. Here's some food for thought. I have what he is talking about, the mutant MTHFR gene, and my cholesterol has always been over 300. And I have an integrative MD, and he said, I wouldn't worry about it, but if you think you're worried, have a, a coronary calcium test, which I did, and I have zero plaque. So my high cholesterol has nothing to do with my arteries getting clogged. But, you know, that's just what I have because of the genetic thing. Makes your hair pretty. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You know, I, I found that the um, natural immunity is amazing for emergencies and life threatening. But they want to push on the medicine too fast and they don't want to get, get you off of it. And so that's when I think more problems are added. But what I wanted to ask you about specific was the cortisol. Um, are there situations when you have too much cortisol and it's harmful for you? And what would cause that? Not really, because when you look at it, cortisol is the greatest anti-inflammatory ever. Now, ex in, so in short term, cortisol is the greatest thing you could possibly have. It prepares you for battle, it's an anti-inflammatory. Long term, cortisol can absolutely damage the tissue and can destroy you, but it's not the cortisol that's the problem. Cortisol is, is produced in response to physical, chemical, or emotional stress. So if you have excess cortisol levels, it's not because of you know, the adrenal glands going crazy, unless there's some weird tumor there. It's generally because of an excessive um, exposure to physical, chemical, or emotional stress, which cause cortisol levels to be elevated. Could hypothyroidism now change that a little bit? When you <laughs> this is why we got seven lectures on thyroid. You've got the adrenal thyroid balance. If the adrenals are firing off, the thyroid's gonna appear lower. Okay, so you've gotta look at it. It could be nutrient deficiency is gonna cause the thyroid to be lower, and that's gonna cause the adrenals to be firing off more. There's gonna be a balance there. You gotta, you gotta do more detective work. It's not, it's not cortisol. I fired my endocrinologist and I went to a natural, um, what do they call it, um, uh, homeopathic type doctor. And I, now I take just a half a pill a day, and I originally was on like 18 or 50 milligrams of that PTP to, for hyperthyroidism. So when I, get, I got away from all that, I've seen all of these things, and I thought I had adrenal fatigue because I had, you know, thyroid storms. Mm -hmm. Something to save, you know, save my life. But I couldn't get away from that stuff. You know, I didn't know how to get my life back. Natural. Yeah, natural, natural generally works. I mean, it, appreciate that the body's smart. And next week, we're also gonna go into more heart health. You should definitely make it there, Doc. Okay, it might challenge some of your belief systems, but it's gonna be vital. Okay. Yes, ma'am. How can we protect ourselves from dementia? Um, healthy fats, don't take poisons or toxins. Watch any medications. Okay, and if you have to take them, find out why you're taking them. Because the, the, the brain is, it has a neuroplastic effect. Movement, exercise, healthy nutrients, um, fats and minerals are vital. If you take toxic substances, you know, particularly anything that's injected or synthetic, it's not good for the nervous system. That's why there's actually a barrier between the blood and the brain, because those neurons in there actually function at a very delicate pH. And so the brain's designed to be healthy. And there's also a neuroplastic um, aspect of the brain where it can regenerate new neurons, uh, not just dendritic cells, it can actually grow new neurons through movement. So movement, healthy fats, and no toxins, and you're gonna be okay. Okay, next week, more heart stuff. Thank you very much.